Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our second keynote speaker, Nick Carter, General Partner, Castle Island Ventures. So I'm talking about Bitcoin mining in Texas. Ted, Senator Ted Cruz this morning gave some incredible comments who actually mirror exactly what I intended to say in the talk. Uh, so I'm really happy about that. I'm just gonna reinforce some of what uh, the Senator said about the influence of Bitcoin mining on the Texas grid, which is something that is an, gonna be an enormous topic of conversation in the months to come. So I'm just gonna do a little refresher on Bitcoin's environmental impact and some of the numbers around that. And then we're gonna look at, at the specific grid transformation that's happening in Texas and how Bitcoin can be highly accretive and actually synergistic with the grid and achieve some of these grid stability goals. Uh, and it's an incredible story. I'm very excited to tell it to you today. So if you actually look at uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, it, it accounts for around 100 terawatt hours of energy, uh, which is a pretty small portion of global energy spend. It's still material, probably 20 to 30 basis points of global electricity production in a given year. Uh, and in terms of uh, some comparisons, people like to compare it to countries. That doesn't make any sense. Let's compare it to industries. Uh, so, you know, Bitcoin mining is somewhat comparable to the zinc extraction industry, uh, if you want a sense of sort of scale and, and proportionality. But it is a large industry, and it's an industry that is very much a Texas industry. Uh, and so, you know, it's around $15 billion a year in rewards, probably more like 20, 25 billion, uh, because the price went up since I made these slides. You know, it is very much a U.S. industry. Um, Cambridge University published some data showing that the share was up to 16% earlier this year, that share is well over 30% today. Uh, and so Bitcoin mining is 30% US based as of today. Uh, and that's up from single digits uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and so, you know, these are pretty incredible numbers. There's an enormous transformation happening right in front of our eyes. And Texas is a key part of this story. Uh, and so if you, project the U.S. at around 30% of the global Bitcoin market, Texas potentially growing to 50%, which I think is completely plausible, you could see two to three gigawatts of Bitcoin mining in Texas by the end of next year. And uh, for context, for context, the Texas grid is around 80 gigawatts in size. And so, you know, there's an enormous um, kind of disruption that's happening, uh, but for the better. And so um, Foundry were very kind and they shared with me some of the data in terms of where their clients are operational. Um, and Texas, according to their data set, is one of the most important states uh, in the union. Uh, and keep in mind that it doesn't include several very large miners in Rockdale, Texas. So my subjective view is that Texas is the number one state for Bitcoin mining in the United States. So I'm very excited by that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a native Texan but it is incredibly cool to be here and see the transformation that's happening in front of our very eyes today. So if you actually look at the disclosures, what miners are announcing, what they're doing, they are aggressively buying these mining machines. Uh, but more generally, these miners are raising a huge amount of capital. They're going public. They have the access to the world's best capital markets here in the United States, and they are expanding. And if you look at the names, you're seeing a lot of Texas-based miners expanding. So it's a story of capitalization and growth, and it's a story of an industry that's going from shadowy offshore to U.S. onshore and, you know, fundamentally more transparent. So Texas, why is it good for Bitcoin mining? Well, first of all, it has a very capacious grid. It's a um, deregulated grid. Um, so there is real time spot pricing the miners can sort of trade against. Uh, there is significant excess energy, and we're going to dig into that in a second. There's a huge amount of uh, stranded or flared natural gas, as Senator Ted Cruz mentioned. Uh, the plurality of uh, flared natural gas in the United States is in Texas. Um, and potentially immersion mining is going to mean that mining is more viable in Texas, where it's pretty hot. Um, so if you actually look at the renewable landscape in Texas, it's changing really, really quickly. Texas is probably the number one place in the U.S. for the conjunction of wind and solar. Uh, and in particular, West Texas. Uh, so if you look at one of these maps is wind map and one is a solar suitability map, they align right there in Northwest Texas. Uh, and, you know, those prices have been coming down really quickly. So 
your uh, you know, new unit of solar in ERCOT will cost you something like 2.8 cents per kilowatt hour, which is super, super cheap. Uh, and this is manifested in an enormous growth of renewables on ERCOT, on the Texan grid. And so you're looking at maybe 30% of the grid is wind and solar today. Uh, and you have you know, maybe 80 gigawatts, 80, 100 gigawatts of solar in the interconnection queue leading up to 2026. So huge amounts of renewable are gonna come online in Texas but of course, they have a different load uh, generation pattern from thermal energy. So they're just fundamentally more intermittent, which is a real challenge. And so you have these events like negative pricing events where the entities that are producing power actually pay people to take the power away from them. Uh, and you know, that is evidence of enormous inefficiency. It basically means there's no economic buyer uh, at you know, certain points, times of day, you know, when the sun is shining, the wind is blowing, and the grid just doesn't have the demand. Uh, and these negative pricing events are getting more and more common as renewables gain market share on the grid. So there's a huge growth of renewables, but there's also a lot of new inefficiency and surplus capacity in the Texan grid, which of course is perfect for miners uh, to exploit. The other problem is that wind and solar don't exactly produce energy in the same shape that the grid demands it. They don't produce it at the right times of day necessarily, and they're just more intermittent. So it helps to have an additional buyer of that energy that's uncorrelated with the way the grid demands the energy. And so this is real-time data from uh, two weeks ago. Um, the blue is cheap power and the yellow is expensive power. And so the Texas grid is not unified. It's kind of bifurcated because it's expensive to transmit some of this energy from the West to places like Austin, where we are. And so if you're looking at 32 gigawatts of power in West Texas, and only five gigawatts of demand, and only 10 to 12 gigawatts of transmission down here, you're just gonna have a lot of energy that is completely wasted, it's surplus energy. And of course, we're seeing minor interest in places like West Texas. So, you know, what does Bitcoin have to say about all this, right? I've been just talking about the Texas grid. What is Bitcoin's effect on this? So first of all, I want to talk about flared gas mitigation. There's a number of companies active in Texas that are taking advantage of the gas that gets flared off at these oil wells, which isn't economical to put into pipelines, it just gets flared. And instead of doing that, which is a pretty inefficient process, you simply capture the gas, you put it in a generator, and you mine Bitcoin. Uh, and that's not, uh, there's no net new emissions from that process. In fact, it's more efficient from an emissions perspective to burn it in a controlled sense uh, instead of actually uh, doing a flaring, which is generally uh, you know, less efficient. Uh, and so you know, if you actually add up all the flared gas in Texas uh, and put it to work mining Bitcoin, you probably get a figure of something like 30% of the Bitcoin network could be powered by that alone. Uh, and so you know, this is an enormous resource which miners are just beginning to tap. It's completely off-grid, so no one's being deprived of energy. This is a completely off-grid process. Then, you know, you have this notion of a flexible offtake. So this means uh, Bitcoin is this independent buyer that can buy energy from energy producers if they need it. And, uh, you know, it's just useful to have an uncorrelated energy buyer. It makes their projects more economical. So this is the similar curve I showed you earlier with wind and solar and you have this surplus when it's the middle of the day and people maybe aren't running their AC as much. And so Bitcoin miners can be this buyer during these off-peak moments when there's a surplus and they can turn themselves off because they represent interruptible load. That's load which can just simply be turned off at short notice. They can turn themselves off when the grid is in distress. And so that's incredibly useful for the grid. On the one hand, you monetize the energy assets which are generating surplus energy. On the other hand, you can interrupt your load. You can turn off your demand when the grid you know, wants to deliver to households and when you have a scarcity of energy. So Bitcoin miners are this energy sponge and we will hear from you know, real Bitcoin miners on the next panel about how they're doing this exact procedure. Uh, and you know, so I, I think that's an incredibly important uh, you know, notion that is very much under underappreciated, and we're going to see many more announcements from real large energy companies that are actually taking advantage of this. So this is not just the realm of fantasy. This is actually happening right now. 
Uh, and there's already a bunch of case studies of mining improving the economics for underutilized energy assets, which can't really sell to the grid all the time. So nuclear is a great example because nuclear generates power in this sort of flat, stable way, and uh, the grid demands energy in a fluctuating way. And so Bitcoin miners can be this offtake for those nuclear power plants when the grid doesn't really need it. Lastly, and this is one of the most important and critical things that's happening here, uh, which actually Senator Cruz touched on, is the notion of miners providing demand response functionality to the grid. And this is a little esoteric, but it's incredibly important. So effectively, the notion of demand response is this idea that when grids are extremely taxed and uh, under pressure, certain industrial centers of load can turn themselves off and alleviate the pressure on the grid. And demand response is a general term. Um, generally, uh, it can happen in just a pure economic free markets way, where spot prices of energy get really high and you know, industrial consumers of energy just turn themselves off. Um, but it, you know, there's also uh, you know, specific demand response programs that ERCOT will run. And so they'll ask you know, industrial consumers, they'll command them or ask them politely to turn off their energy when the grid most needs it, uh, when you know, it's a peak time and they don't want to have rolling blackouts. Uh, more interestingly, um, there's this notion of controllable load, which means you are in constant communication with the grid operator and they ask you to dial down your consumption on a very high frequency basis, maybe within 15 or 30 seconds. And very, very few other industries can actually do this. Because, you know, think of an aluminum smelting plant or uh, commercial real estate where you have to keep the lights on. You can't just turn off your power consumption. You certainly can't moderate it uh, in a highly granular, high frequency way. Uh, however, Bitcoin miners can do this. Bitcoin miners can dial up and down their consumption uh, in line with the grid operator's wishes. Um, and, you know, they can certainly turn themselves off at short notice. So they're not like other uh, large-scale consumers of energy. Bitcoin miners are this heavily interruptible load, uh, which is an incredibly important feature for grids that might you know, occasionally have these uh, you know, spikes in demand. Uh, it's incredibly useful to have miners participate in these programs, and they already are. They already are. So grid operators are aware of miners uh, behaving this way, and they're working with them to help balance out the grid. And as you have more and more renewables on the grid, the grid becomes, generally speaking, less reliable because renewables are less predictable in terms of their generation patterns. And so as you have these greener grids, which is the direction we're going, having these large scale flexible data centers available to moderate their demand uh, is an incredibly useful feature. And so this is real data that I pulled from 2021, uh, the Texas grid uh, showing uh, effectively the price distribution uh, on the spot market this year. And so you see that there's certainly there's actually negative pricing events on the left tail there when effectively there was a huge amount of surplus energy and no one to consume it. And then on the right tail you have uh, you know the extremely negative um, or you have the enormously high power prices that we had for a short period of time during the you know big outage. And so what the miners would do is they consume the energy that's very cheap, uh, in particular when it's negatively priced. Uh, and so they are the buyer at that point. When the energy gets really expensive and the grid is distressed, they turn themselves off. Uh, and they contractually agree to do that. Uh, and so what the effect of more Bitcoin mining on the grid would be is cutting off both tails in that distribution and effectively stabilizing energy prices. So when things are bad and energy prices go super high, the miners are off. And when energy is super abundant, the miners are on. And so this vastly improves the sort of fundamental economics of the grid. And now this is a stylized uh, set of data showing exactly how this would work with flexible load uh, and having data centers that can turn themselves on and off. Uh, this is a great paper on the topic from Lansom, which I really recommend. Um, and so that's really the key. You know, there's three major things. One, flared gas mining, which is absolutely happening in Texas right now. There's a bunch of names doing it. Two, acting as this economic offtake 
effectively buying energy from uh, these projects, which are just simply not producing energy to the grid um, and may have excesses of energy. And then lastly, participating in these demand response or controllable load programs, which virtually all miners are doing, uh, and helping balance out a grid which is increasingly renewable and increasingly unstable. Uh, and so, you know, it was incredibly encouraging to see Senator Cruz aware of these exact features. Um, and I think that's one reason why miners are so, you know, happy to engage with the state of Texas is the tone of the talk and having policymakers be aligned uh, and supportive of this incumbent, you know, this new incipient industry. Uh, and so, you know, of course, Bitcoin mining is going to be a large center of demand and it's going to keep growing in Texas, but it's also a pattern of demand, which is highly creative to grid stability overall. Uh, so I'll wrap it up there. Thank you.